I never felt bad or guilty or anything like that about any of the people I killed over there. I know I killed a lot of them, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, I was glad for it during the war because that's what wins wars. That's the only time I ever saw a German fighter pilot just 30, 40 feet away. We were looking each other right in the eye, and I'm sure he was thinking the same thing I was. That you poor guy, you're about to die. And we knew one of us was going to. You'd see parachutes coming out, uh, uh, bombers blowing up, uh, uh, you know, wings coming off, tails coming off, and more American parachutes. It's just not a pretty sight to watch. Okay, this is where I uh, shot down two planes. This plane here is about to blow up right now. I'm filling full of lead right now. And his fuselage tank will explode here shortly. And then when he flies out of it, I go ahead and attack him and put him into the ground. It seemed like there must have been about 30 soldiers in the truck. And I imagine most of them died from that, I don't know. But uh, I just made one pass at them, filled that truck full of 50 caliber lead, and uh, I'm sure killed over half of them. It's kind of a sad thing, you know, seeing someone uh, hit the ground before the parachute opens. I was young, eager, aggressive. Uh, I had no feeling about uh, killing someone. Uh, it sounds kind of cruel to talk, but that's what you do in wartime. You've got to defeat the enemy, and uh, that's what I did. Hey there, this is Rishi Sharma. I'm the one who interviews the World War II veterans for this channel. As we come up on the 80th anniversary of D-Day this year, I just want to remind everybody how important it is to capture these frontline testimonies of the remaining veterans while they are still amongst us. I have dedicated the last seven years of my life to finding and interviewing as many World War II veterans as possible. As you can imagine, it costs a lot of money to travel to the veterans and tell their story in a professional way. There are still so many perspectives from the war that need to be documented for future generations. So that is why I'm asking anyone who cares about these veterans and their sacrifices to please consider donating at www.rememberww2.org. Or you could also become a Patreon member to help get more of these heroes on camera forever. You can make a donation and dedication to a family member of yours who served in the war, and we will feature their bio in an upcoming video. We owe it to this generation to never forget the sacrifices paid for our freedoms. All of the links are in the description, and all donations go directly to travel costs. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And remember, God bless the World War II veterans. We owe them everything. Now it's time to meet a bona fide American war hero. But you won't ever catch him using that word to describe himself. All right, my name is Joe H. Joyner. I flew uh, with the 4th Fighter Group during World War II in England. I shot down four enemy aircraft. I destroyed four enemy aircraft on the ground. And I flew 84 combat missions, 371 combat hours, which included two 50-hour extensions in uh, combat. And I flew one mission on my third 50-hour uh, extension before I was grounded and sent home saying I needed a rest from combat. I flew P-51s. We, we escorted bombers on most of our missions. 
and uh, we'd join and escort them for a few hundred miles. We couldn't escort them uh, all the way to the target or all the way back from the target because we didn't have the fuel. And we had to fly at a higher airspeed than the bombers were flying at. So we had to S back and forth to stay with our bombers. And uh, so we could not, we'd stay with our bombers for maybe 200 miles and then have to break off and come home. And on our way home, many times, we would drop down on the deck and strafe anything that we saw that was of military value. And, uh, you know, trains, boats, uh, trucks, tanks, anything that the military that you could see, we would strafe. Uh, we did that on many, many missions. My favorite, I used to really enjoy strafing trains. The engines would just blow sky high smoke, you know, when you'd strafe them. And I can remember strafing, you know, four or five different ones in one mission. Uh, and I really enjoyed strafing those trains because, you know, you strafe a truck, it doesn't seem to blow up or anything, but you strafe a uh, train engine, it just kind of blows smoke everywhere, you know, when you strafe it. And I used to really enjoy strafing them. Well, I would always tack the engine first and get it to blow up and then just drive your ammo all the way down the train, just trying to put lead in every car. And you could do that just by turning and pulling all the way through, you know, firing all the time and uh, just destroying a train. And we could get an awful lot of those, it seemed like. Almost on every mission, you could find at least one train. My understanding is that a lot of these German trains had armor men and they had anti-aircraft gunners. They did. Sometimes, you know, it'd be strafing a train and hauling boxcars and the sides, the boxcars would fold down and you'd see the, the ammo coming out of them, you know. But uh, they were not very effective. You could, when you, when they, you see the sides drop down, you could put your bullets in there before they get lined up with you. I never had any problem with that. It didn't, didn't bother me much because I figured I could get them before they could get me. Well, uh, we'd carry two 500 pound bombs, one under each wing. And uh, I, the most significant one I remember, uh, there was a train that was just entered a tunnel and I went up to the head of where the train was going and bombed, closed the exit with a bomb, and then pulled around and bombed the entrance point with another bomb. So I had them close in. I was kind of proud of the fact that I closed that train in, inside, you know, from both, close both ends of the tunnel. I'm sure he got out okay later on, but he was in there for a while before he came out. This one specific that I remember, uh, uh, the truckload of German soldiers. And that was probably the, I didn't get strafe many, just, just human beings. Uh, they just weren't available. But, but there was one big truckload uh, of army personnel that I, that I strafed. And that was probably the only big time uh, personnel uh, attacks that, that I made uh, on this uh, truckload of German soldiers. It seemed like there must have been about 30 soldiers in the truck, and I imagine most of them died from that, I don't know. But uh, I just made one pass at them, filled that truck full of 50 caliber lead, and uh, I'm sure killed over half of them. I was always an athlete in school, always competition. And I think I kind of carried that over into the war. And uh, any time I saw a target, it was, I just took it as an enemy and, uh, and went after it. Uh, I had no feeling about uh, killing someone. Uh, it sounds kind of cruel to talk, but that's what you do in wartime. You've got to defeat the enemy. 
And uh, that's what I did. And I never felt bad or guilty or anything like that about any of the people I killed over there. I know I killed a lot of them, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, I was glad for it during the war because that's what wins wars. If you're going to feel guilty about killing someone, killing the enemy, uh, you better not be in the war. You've got to go after it 100 uh, percent. There's no host barred. Uh, just like any sporting event, you put every ounce of energy you have into that event. You do the same thing in combat. It's uh, just a matter of who wins. That's a pretty long story. First plane I shot down. It was the most amazing thing that happened to me during World War II. I am leading Green Flight. I was a brand new flight leader. It's one of my first missions as a flight leader. I was still uh, learning combat. I didn't know anything about combat. It's very few hours and uh, very inexperienced and was not qualified really to be a flight leader, but I was anyway. And uh, I was leading Green Flight. Green Flight's job is kind of to protect the rear of the squadron. And the other three are kind of the offensive eyes. And looking up ahead, we were flying at about 25,000 feet. And at about uh, 28 or maybe 30,000 feet, I looked straight ahead and saw in my logbook, I wrote down about 80 enemy aircraft coming head on toward us. Uh, the German fighters did not want to attack the American fighters. They wanted to shoot down bombers because the bombers were destroying their cities and they tried to avoid the American fighter pilots. Uh, and that was a decision that caused them to lose the war in my estimation. But anyway, uh, these planes flew over us and our squadron leader at that time was Captain Fred Glover. And I guess he maybe as a major then. Yes, he was. He was map reading. We were deep in Germany. The squadron leader had to have a map full of, a cockpit full of maps. He had to identify railroads and rivers and towns and highways, anything, you know. You had to know exactly where you were. We had no radar. But we had to pinpoint our identity, our, our location all the way to, we had specific rendezvous points for the bombers. So, uh, one group would be dropping off as you would be picking up the escort mission. And uh, so with these planes flying over us, this large formation, I estimated to be 80 airplanes. Our, our squadron leader didn't see them. I did, I, and everybody else in the squadron did also, I'm sure. But I was the newest flight commander there, and so, so new and inexperienced. Uh, I didn't say a word. I was just watching them, and they flew over us and just kept going. Nobody said a word. But I, without saying a word, turned my four ship flight, chasing this large formation. I had no idea what to do, how to attack a formation like that. I just thought that I'd fly up the rear end and start shooting and see what happened. I hadn't had any real combat experience up to that time. I was still a novice. And uh, while we were chasing him, my wingman said, uh, Green Leader, those are friendly aircraft. And I said, no, they're ME-109s. And I don't know where he got the thought they were friendly, but Glover heard that, our squadron commander, and said, what's going on? I told him I was chasing about 80 ME-109s, large formation. He said, what's your heading? I said, 270. And he said, make your squadron turn 270. And I said, it's too late for you. We're 50 miles from you by now. There's no way you'll ever catch us. He said, I'm going to try anyway. And he never did catch up. With my four ship flight, I'm climbing up the rear end of this large formation. And uh, this is about to get, uh, I said, drop tanks and attack. 
and we were just in firing position, seven ME-109s from the formation, broke out to the right, came around to getting on our tail, and if we had kept chasing this large formation, these seven had been on our tail shooting us down. So we couldn't let that happen. We had to break, I had to break off the, the attack on the large formation and break around to the right. And my four planes went in battle with these seven. And uh, we went round and round, up and down. And the leader of the seven and I were tangled and everybody else went to the deck. The leader and I stayed at altitude fighting, turning. And uh, I shot mine down and uh, uh, my number three man uh, shot one down, so we shot two down. That was the only two destroyed for that day. How were you able to shoot the leader down, sir? Well, uh, we had a long air battle. Uh, we went round and round for a while. I finally got on his tail and uh, pressed the trigger to fire and my ammo, nothing came out. <laughs> Guns didn't fire. I thought, I'm in deep trouble here. I'm in a dogfight for my life and I have no weapon. And I put my head in the cockpit trying to figure out what happened. And dumb me, I had forgot to arm my guns or turn on my safety switches. Two switches we had to turn on. I had turned either one of them on. And while I'm turning those on, my head in the cockpit, the enemy aircraft got on my tail. And so we had to battle and battle and battle. I had to really fight to get him off my tail. I could see him shooting, but I wasn't letting him pull enough lead. I was turning so tight, he could not pull enough lead. All of his ammo was going behind me, and I could see that. And we just kept going, and finally, I got on his tail, and I'm pulling right up to fire and get, uh, fire him down, and the canopy came off. And I had to dodge, the canopy came just right through our airplane almost. And then a few seconds later, he came out. And he came closer than the canopy. He came right by my propeller, it seemed like. And of course, the plane had to straighten down and crashed and burned. But he bailed out. You always bailed out of fuel when you end, a, end an air battle. You burn fuel like mad, you know, with everything to the firewall. You're getting all the power you can get out of your airplane. And uh, the fuel goes amazingly fast. It, uh, everything on the firewall. So usually after a little air battle, you had to head straight home. So you had to, we usually had five, maybe four or 500 miles after the air battle to get back to friendly territory. So we were always at a disadvantage. Could you please tell me, sir, what is going on in your head in the middle of an air battle, like the one you just described, when all this turning is going on, I mean, what are you concentrating on? How do you even focus when someone's trying to shoot you down? Well, for me, uh, I was just pretty dumb, I guess. I was cocky. I, I thought I was the best fighter pilot in the world. I certainly wasn't, but I thought I was. And I didn't think any German fighter pilot could outfly me. I just felt uh, like there's nobody better than me. And uh, that was far from the truth, but uh, I think having confidence in your own ability removes any fear that uh, some people had. And I had no fear ever, no fear in air combat. Just uh, I uh, took it as kind of like a, a sporting event. When you tangle with an airplane, you just give it everything you've got and hope it's enough to beat the other guy, just like it's you know, in any kind of athletic belt, belt, beat. You, uh, you just try to be tougher than the other guy. Okay, I remember one mission, October the 6th, where we were uh, escorting the bombers to Berlin. I was briefed on the mission to uh, lead our squadron. Uh, I was a fairly new pilot in the squadron and was not 
really qualified to be leading the squadron, but somehow they designated me as a squadron leader, leading 16 airplanes uh, on a combat mission when you were as inexperienced as I was. But uh, uh, So I had to make decisions along that escort mission. We had to fly uh, Z patterns, they called it, while your bombers were flying straight toward the target, we had to Z out, Z in. When we were seeing out on one of the Z out missions, uh, about 30 ME-109s dropped out of the clouds and made a head-on pass at the bombers that I was supposed to be protecting. I had the squadron out of position and I immediately called to drop tanks and attack and turned back toward the squadron but the Huns came through the squadron of bombers about the time that my squadron uh, got there. We couldn't fire because we would hit the bombers. Uh, the enemy fighters were flying through and uh, just shooting down bombers like mad, and we could not fire at them because they were in the middle of the, the, fight, the bombers. But after they came out the tail end, of the bomber formation. Then I latched on to the first one that came out. I assume he was the leader of that 30 ship formation, I'm not sure. It, and we had quite a long dogfight and I finally uh, clobbered him real good and watched him crash into the ground and explode. And as I recall, I was the only one that day that shot down an enemy fighter. I don't know what happened to everyone else, but I guess they disappeared in the clouds. Could you please tell us more about uh, the dogfight you had with the German leader? Yeah, this one was uh, quite different. Uh, we fought for a long time, turning back and forth, trying to outturn the other one. I could, he could be kind of on my tail, and I could see him firing at me, but uh, his bullets were all going behind me. I was turning so tight that he could not lead me. He'd have to fire, you know, two or three hundred yards in front of me to get any hits because of, I was turning so tight. So that went on for quite a while. And finally, uh, we both came, pulled out of a dive and I kind of climbed up on his side. I was about to overrun him. and. Uh, we came right together, about 30 or 40 feet apart, going straight up. And uh, you're not going to go straight up in a P-51 very long before you stall out. That's the only time I ever saw a German fighter pilot just 30, 40 feet away. We were looking each other right in the eye, and I'm sure he was thinking the same thing I was. That you poor guy, you're about to die. And we knew one of us was going to. But we're going straight up, and when that happens, you can't go very long. You start losing speed, you start vibrating. And then the more you vibrate, and finally when you totally lose speed, your nose drops. Whoever drops first, the second one drops down and has got easy victory. And we both knew that. We're looking at each other, you know, 30 feet apart, right at each other's eyes. And, and uh, I was able to hang on a little longer. We just ran down to zero airspeed. His nose dropped. As soon as he did, I dropped and just filled him full of lead. And uh, he didn't have a chance. I just had him all the way. Totally destroyed him. He flew right into the ground, exploded. Uh, whoever could outturn the, the other pilot uh, is going to win the battle normally. And I found he could put 20 degrees of flaps down and that would tighten your turn. It was kind of dangerous because it would take some of your airspeed away. But uh, when you're in a critical situation and turning means everything, you can put 20 degrees of flaps down and tighten your turn up, and hopefully tighter than your enemy's turning radius. And whoever can outturn, the other one is normally going to win the air battle. Thank you so much for sharing that. Could you tell us more visually what you remember 
when these ME-109s attacked the bomber formation, what did you actually see? Well, of course, you see exploded explosions. Uh, it's a sight that you don't like to see. You, bombers uh, just explode so easy with all of the fuel and all the bombs that they carry. And you'd see parachutes coming out, uh, uh, bombers blowing up, uh, uh, you know, wings coming off, tails coming off, and more American parachutes. It's just not a pretty sight to watch. Make you feel kind of inadequate and not protecting your bombers more. It seemed to be weather over Germany just about all of the time. And what they really liked was to drop out of clouds just in front of the bombers and make a head-on pass. Uh, they had radar, you know, and we did not. Uh, so if they could tell uh, when the bombers were in firing range for the 109s, uh, they could tell on the radar when them to drop out of the clouds and attack the bombers. We had to wait until they dropped out of the clouds to know they were there because we had no radar. Once we saw them, we'd turn into them and try to attack them, but it was hard to get to them before they'd get to the bombers. Our squadron lost 46 pilots in six months, and I would say that uh, two-thirds of those losses were strafing airdromes. When you went across an airdrome, you had bullets coming at you from all sides of that uh, airdrome. And uh, if you could get through one and destroy an enemy aircraft, you're pretty fortunate, it seemed like, without getting hit. To get credit for a, a ground victory, you had to set the plane on fire. Many times you would uh, you'd get hits on planes, but they wouldn't catch fire. So you wouldn't get credit for it. I strafed quite a few. Uh, they put fake aerodromes out to, they'd hide their, they'd have an aerodrome, and they'd hide their actual aircraft in a forest outside the airdrome and put fake planes, you know, uh, on the airdrome and you'd go in strafe, you'd recognize that right away, you know. Everybody had their own idea, I think. I had the idea that the lower you got going across the airdrome, the better your chance was to get through without being hit. Uh, their firepower, you know, was up on the pedestals all around the airplane, all around the airport. And uh, if you got real low on the deck and they have to fire down at you a little bit or, or level, if they fire that way, their, their friends are over here. <laughs> so it makes it difficult to fire at, 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 you know, straight and level when you know your bullets are going into the more friendly troops. So I felt the lower you get, the better. The better chance you had of not getting hit. And how low are we talking about, sir? Well, I'm 10 feet above the ground, something like that. You had to just put your propeller almost in the dust. Well, you're usually going about 350 miles an hour or something like that, you know. And uh, you just put your target on, a, on one of the airplanes and press the trigger and see what happens. Hope he blows up. You mentioned that on your last mission, the 84th mission, you shot down a couple planes. Yes. Could you please take us through the circumstance, the, the whole story? Okay, we're flying, we're down low. Uh, we, had, we were coming back from an escort mission, as I remember. Uh, we were deep in Germany, and we were down to about 5,000 feet. I was leading blue flight. Uh, and uh, two Mach uh, 190s flew under me. I was flying at about 5,000 feet with my four ship flight. And two uh, airplanes flew under me. They, I'm sure they just got trapped there. They, they didn't see me, I didn't see them. But they flew under me, I saw them both. And the, the, the wingman had a belly tank. And I, when I turned into them, 
I fired at the, the wingman first with this belly tank. And it just blew sky high. My bullets went right through his tank and then a huge ball of flame. And I flew through the flame and he's still flying. Uh, the tank blew up, but the airplane didn't blow up. So I just filled that plane full of lead. I just, I put, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of rounds I put in him. And he just crashed real big immediately. And then I had a little air battle with the leader. He and I went round and round quite a bit, and we're both right on the deck. And I finally got on his tail and started just filling his cockpit full of lead. I uh, just uh, just put bullets everywhere. I'm sure he was flying at about 100 feet, and I was filling the cockpit, cockpit full of 50 caliber. And I'm sure he was dead when he hit the ground. He hit the ground. Uh, pretty hard, but the plane did not blow up. It just kind of skidded in. And uh, so that was the end of that air battle. My plane took some serious damage several times. It was shot down when other pilots were flying it. But uh, I took a few holes, not many, very few holes that I ever uh, get in my airplane. I don't think an enemy fighter ever put a hole in my plane. It was just ground flak. And I was so proud of my flying ability and turning ability, I didn't think any German fighter pilot could, could outturn me. And I'm sure they could, but I didn't think that way. Well, I had a great mechanic. Uh, he worked on my plane day and night. When I, as soon as I'd land, he'd start going all over the plane checking for da battle damage. And very seldom was there any on there. He'd see bullet holes occasionally, but uh, not often. And he would spend the next 24 hours getting that plane ready for the next mission. And he was always just in perfect condition when I took off the next day. After strafing this aerodrome, uh, we pulled up to head home. And uh, when we were, we were flying back to England, started getting socked in with weather. And it eventually came down all over England with zero, zero. And our group was heading back to England and our group leader uh, and everybody else except me heard that what was happening, we still own aerodromes in uh, France. So most of our group landed in France. And uh, my four ship flight was the only flight in the group that headed back to Debden. I didn't receive the message on bad weather. I didn't know the weather was bad there, but it got within about 100 miles of Debden. I started calling the tower and uh, asking what the weather was, and they said, zero, zero. And I kept bringing my four ship flight back to England, back to Debden to land, and uh, I got over Debt and I said, uh, please fire a rocket up so I can see exactly where Debt is. And they fired a, a rocket. And I saw it about 10 miles away, so I knew I was right over an aerodrome. And I told them I was bringing my four ship flight in for landing. They said, you can't come in. It's zero, zero. No landing. The field is closed. And I, they said, uh, no landing. And I said, I've got to land. I've got to land my flight. And they said, nope, the field is closed. There's no way you can land. And I said, what's the nearest open air drone? And they said, in Scotland. <laughs> and I said, how far is Scotland? And they told me something, I don't know, 300 miles. I had about five minutes of fuel left. I could go 20 miles, maybe five, five miles. And so, I had, I just made a dumb decision. I thought I could land, uh, I didn't realize it was fog. I thought I'd get down to 50 feet, I'd be able to see. But with fog, you can't, you know, it goes to zero, zero. But I knew we had to land, I thought, a very dumb mistake on my part. I said, told my, I had a four ship flight. I told them to stack up above me Usually they stack down, 
but when you're going down for lower altitude landing, you, you stack, have your, your pilots stack up. So if anybody hits the ground, the leader does. And we let down, kept letting down, kept letting down, getting down to just zero, zero, and all of a sudden we hit trees. And I pulled the formation back up. My left wing man, Lieutenant Hall, he hit a big tree, I guess, was killed. My right wing man, uh, number three man, Hagen, pulled up and bailed out. And my number four man had already broken off. I didn't have him when we got there. But anyway, I, then uh, I had no wingmen. And uh, they, there was an airfield in England that they pour gasoline in a ditch along the side of the runway and light the gasoline. It would lift the fog up for uh, two or three minutes, and if you could get to the airfield and land that length of time, you had a chance of surviving. And that fortunately happened to me. Uh, I was just about ready to crash when I saw this light up field, and it lifted the weather for, I don't know, maybe five minutes. And I turned straight toward it, put my wheels down, landed on the runway, coasted down to the end of the runway and ran out of gas at the end of the runway. A miracle that I survived that. Vertigo was a real tough tame thing to deal with uh, uh, for a new pilot. It, you had to have vertigo quite a few times before you, before you handled it, were able to master it. Uh, you fly into clouds and uh, you can't see anything except your instruments. You just have to fly on instruments. And if you accidentally push in, say, the right rudder, your plane starts skidding, and your brain starts skidding. And uh, sometimes you think you're flying upside down when you're flying right side up. Uh, you have to learn uh, how to deal with vertigo. You had to believe your instruments and not your brain. Brain would tell you that uh, you're flying inverted, but the instruments say you're flying right. So you had to believe your instruments. And many times, many pilots would, breathe, would believe their brain over their instruments and cause serious problems. Vertigo uh, was something that a new pilot had to learn how to master. Netting, we were going on a dive bomb mission. We were bombing. Uh, railroad tracks primarily, and engines and uh, trains. And uh, he went in on his run and uh, didn't pull out. He was diving toward the, this train and uh, just, I guess he must have been hit by flak. He flew right into the train with his airplane and of course exploded and blew sky high. <laughs> he was flying on a squadron commander's uh, wing when he was killed, when he flew into this train. Uh, I like to always get the engine first. That's what I uh, uh, preferred strafing. Put as many rounds you can into the engine, and then after he's blown up and pretty well destroyed, then you go on down the rest of the train. But are you attacking the engine from the side, or are you straight coming straight on, like as if you're... It was usually from the side, yes. We dropped down to two or three thousand feet, angle down toward them, you know, and when you got in range, uh, three, four, five hundred yards away, you just open fire, fire until you got down, you know, real close and it had to pull up. You couldn't see your ammo, you'd see when you get hits. It was called armor piercing incendiary. So when your bullets hit the target, you see a flash, big flash of light. You could tell you were getting a good hit. I always enjoyed strafing trains, watching engines blow their smoke, you know, and they uh, would make a pretty impressive sight when you strafe the engines. My roommate and best friend in World War II, Lieutenant Prini, uh, had a mid-air collision, bailed out. He was uh, unhurt, 
And uh, I can tell you something a little comical if you want me to, sure. but you probably can edit this out. Uh, anyway, uh, I knew he had had a mid-air collision and bailed out, and we got a phone call. He landed about you know, 100 miles from our home base, and uh, we got a phone call saying he had bailed out and he was okay. And uh, he and I both had a pair of brand new boots, flying boots that we bought from London. Beautiful boots. They were the most beautiful boots you ever saw. I had mine for for 30 years, I guess, and just babied them and kept them. So we always line your shoes up under your bed. And when I heard he had bailed out and was okay, I took his beautiful boots and put them under my bed, lined them up with my boots and shoes. And when he, he came back the next day to Debden and walked in his bedroom, saw his boots under my bed, and uh, he said, you dirty rat, you thought I was dead, didn't you? And I said, just hoping. It was, seems kind of cruel and unusual to say, but that's kind of the way we talked then. It, uh, we we joking about uh, death all the time, it seems like. When uh, Don Perini died, I was at his funeral, and uh, uh, I was a pallbearer. And uh, the uh, minister that was conducting the service walked down the, the congregation aisle to where the pallbearers were and uh, talk to us, and uh, he said, I know about the boots, which really caught me off guard, but that's, uh, uh, someone had told him about that boot story, pretty unusual. Well, that was an amazing m mission. It was the first time the Germans used this rocket plane, this 163. Uh, we were flying escorting bombers, and we saw this, uh, as I think it was in the Ruhr Valley somewhere. These uh, rocket planes, the 163s, took off and just flew straight up to about 30,000 feet where the bombers were. And I had never seen anything like that before. I hadn't even heard of a 163. And they flew straight up. Uh, uh, to shoot at the bombers, and, uh, but their fuel only lasted just a matter of probably five minutes, maybe not that much, I don't know. Uh, and our squadron leader, Major Glover, uh, shot one down. Uh, they, had, they would fly up as long as their rockets lasted, and like I said, maybe five minutes, and then they'd become a glide, glide plane with no motor. They were just gliding. And the only safety they had was just to bail out. And this one pilot, I guess, uh, didn't bail out. Glover shot him down when he was gliding down. Well, 262 was, uh, made us uh, wonder how the war was going to end, because they had this fast jet fighter, and we didn't have anything like that. And that 262 could, you know, outrun us. Uh, uh, by a hundred miles an hour, I guess. Uh, but they uh, had a fuel problem, like we did. You know, if we fly f 500 miles into Germany, we've got to watch our fuel. The 262s would would m make an attack on us. We'd have to m turn 180 degrees to try to attack them head on. But they they would always break off, and uh, then we would turn back for England. And when we'd turn back, they'd come in on our tail again. We'd have to turn it head on into them to keep them off our tail. And they were trying to run us out of fuel, and we were trying to, 262s, to run their fuel out. It was kind of a, a guessing game. And fortunately, uh, they had very short range. There was 262 jets. So uh, they would usually run out of fuel, run low on fuel, uh, before we uh, would run completely out of fuel. 
Well, uh, when you're strafing an aerodrome, of course, you're right down on the deck at minimum altitude. And uh, there's a lot of enemy uh, action, uh, enemy guns firing at you. And many of our pilots got hit, uh, planes got hit. And uh, when you took hits, you lo lost airspeed, uh, you know you're not going to fly very long, you pull up to try to get as much altitude as possible. Uh, usually you had to get above 500 feet to have a chance for your parachutes to open. If you couldn't get above 500 feet, you probably not, were not going to survive. And you'd just hope you had enough airspeed. You'd pull up and go as high as it could go, and then you run out of airspeed, the plane starts to drop to the ground, and before that starts, you have to be out of the cockpit hoping your chute will open before you hit the ground. Quite a few times, I think my logbook shows that uh, our pilots uh, bailed out and without enough altitude to survive. Uh, it's kind of a sad thing, you know, seeing someone uh, hit the ground before the parachute opens. Major Goodson was my first commander there. Uh, and uh, I was scheduled on his wing, one of my early flights, my, probably my second or third flight in the P-51. And uh, we, we were flying at about 25,000 feet, and we, uh, someone saw enemy fighters down low. And uh, Major Goodson said, drop tanks and attack. And uh, everybody dropped their tanks, rolled over on their back, headed straight down toward the enemy. When I hit my drop tank switch, one tank came off and one stayed on. There were 108 gallon fuel tanks, one under each wing. One of mine came off and one stayed on, which made me fly sideways. So to fly straight ahead, I'm flying this way with a one, one wing tank on. I couldn't stay up. Everybody left me. I'm alone up in the sky. I pulled G's, zigzagged, everything went dive high speed, did everything I could trying to get rid of that wing tank. I could not. So I'm 500 miles over Germany, all by myself, up in the sky, 25,000 feet, all alone, and with a fighter that I could not fight a war with because of that extra wing tank hanging on one wing, making me fly sideways. Fortunately, no one found me, and I came back to the base alone and made an uneventful landing with that one tank still on. I never could get it off. I never talked anything about World War II until maybe the last 15 years. Uh, up until then, I don't think uh, my friends or relatives or even knew I was in World War II. I never talked about it to anybody. I, I didn't particularly try to hide it, but it was just never a subject that, that would come up. Leading a squadron on 20 missions just sounds uh, impossible when I think back on it. I'm a young, inexperienced lieutenant still trying to learn how to fight the war, and they make me a leader. And I was totally unqualified to be a leader, but uh, I guess somebody had to fill the position and they picked me, by, probably just at random. Do you really think it was at random or do you think they must have seen something in you? Well, I, I was hoping they saw something in me, but I know they put me in positions I was not qualified for, I know. I mean, how did you handle that at that age all these lives that are under your control? Well, of course, you felt the responsibility, of course. But uh, at that age, uh, you think you're a lot better than you actually are and probably have more confidence in your ability than your actual ability. And you don't worry about uh, getting shot down yourself or somebody else getting shot down. You just think about uh, trying to win whatever battle you get into. Some Sundays you would go to church and sometimes you would not. 
Was your was your faith important to you flying? Was what? Your faith important? Ah, uh, well, I don't think any more than anybody else. Is I felt like uh, you know I was a fairly religious person. I believe in it and uh, uh, didn't give it much of a thought. If I was on base, I'd go to church on Sunday, but half the time I was flying combat instead of going to church. Ah, well, I, I think of me as someone who always tried to do his best and uh, hope that was good enough. I'm, I'm sure people will think a lot more than just that. A hero, a good father, uh, a, a, you know, a, a patriot, someone who was willing to sacrifice his life. I mean, you put yourself in a lot of dangerous situations so others wouldn't have to. And I know you like to say it was for the competition, but I have a hard time believing some of it uh, also wasn't a, a sense of duty, you know, so that. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know, I always try to do my best, whatever the job was. Uh, just duck your head down, go in and, and uh, do what's required to be done to accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish. Every air battle that you enter, it winds up one-on-one. -on -one. It starts out maybe with, you know, 50 planes going around the sky, but within about uh, a few seconds, it's one airplane against one other airplane. And uh, one of you is going to win and one of you is going to lose. And you just, it's just the best pilot, I guess, is going to win. You, you, you go straight up, straight down, straight around, pull maximum G's, dive, climb, whatever required to do. You just try to do it better than your opponent. And if you can do it better than he can, uh, you're going to shoot him down. If he can do it better than you are, he's going to shoot you down. So you just got to put your maximum effort in it and say that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to either win or lose. And it's up to your ability to decide which one of those events is going to occur. Well, obviously you won. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was pretty fortunate, I guess, all the, all the way. I always have been. Thank you so much for all your time. Oh, You've been so oh, I, great. I know well, there's a lot. But, not, but God bless you. And just know that you've helped so many people have an opportunity and a full and a free life. And that's something no one can take from you. Well, it's nice meeting you, and it's nice getting to know you. Uh, you seem like a pretty sharp guy. I appreciate you coming over and wasting your time with me. No, I'm definitely not a waste of time, Colonel Joyner. <laughs> You're a little too hard on yourself. Yeah, uh, this is the original film that uh, came out of my airplane after World War II. After every mission, they uh, added it to your roll of film. And I've had this now for 80 years or so. This is the second plane I shot down. Uh, we had quite a long air battle and got really close together. Uh, when I was about to overshoot him, I was close to about 10 or 15 yards from his side. And we were both going straight up. And it was the only time that I ever got to really look an enemy pilot right in the eye. We were close to each other. Uh, and we were both going straight up. We both knew we were going to stall. And when we stalled, you drop off into a spin. The first plane that drops off is going to be the loser because the second can drop off on the tail and shoot him down. And that's exactly what happened. I kept my plane going up longer than he could. And I dropped on his tail and blew him up. Okay, this is where I uh, shot down two planes. This plane here is about to blow up right now. I'm filling full of lead right now. And his fuselage tank will explode here shortly. And then when he flies out of it, I go ahead and attack him and put him into the ground. And this is the second one that I shot down on that day. Uh, he's about to hit the ground here shortly, you'll see. 
I'm putting quite a few rounds in him, and I think he's probably dead, but he's uh, gonna fly right into the ground. My bullets look like they're going into his canopy. That's him hitting the ground right there. Oh, I think this is what you were talking about, about you were trying to take a photo of the plane, but your gun was still on. Yeah. All right, this is me strafing a long train running bullets all the way down all of the box cars, a long train, a lot of hits, a lot of flashes. Oh, another long train, I believe, yeah. I'm walking ammo down the, each box car. All right, this shows me strafing a truck here. I think I get some pretty good hits on him. And two more trucks destroyed right there. And I guess that's another truck also there. Yeah, this is strafing an aerodrome. I'm firing at an ME-109 right there, I believe it is. And you can see I'm getting quite a few hits. And that was the most dangerous job, strafing aerodromes? It was. We lost, most of our pilots lost were strafing aerodromes. Very dangerous thing to do. I think a lot of people who will look at your film, they'll be amazed just about how, how top-notch of a pilot you are. <laughs> you, you had a serious role in contributing to the defeat of Nazi Germany. And that's something you should be so proud about, mm -hmm. Colonel Joyner. You've helped a lot of people live a full and a free life. And that's something no one can ever take from you. Yeah, we did a good job in World War II. Uh, it wasn't easy. It was, a lot of it was very tough, but uh, we managed to pull it through.